Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this year's Military Writer Symposium addressing perception wars in the battle to control reality. This style of event is so unique and beneficial to not only our colleges, but colleges across the United States. I hope all of you take full advantage of the panels and meet as many guests as possible. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Travis Morris, Peace and War Center Director and the Executive Director of the Military Writer Symposium. Go ahead, take your seats. In the digital age, information is power. That power was used to manipulate, deceive, and control. Welcome to the world of information. In the digital age, information is power. But what if that power was used to manipulate, deceive, and control? Welcome to the world of information warfare, a modern battleground where truth is often a casualty and your perception is the target. From false narratives to targeted disinformation, adversaries use sophisticated tactics to spread confusion and create division. These tactics aren't just random, they're strategic. They exploit our emotions, sow distrust, and polarize societies. Understanding how information is used as a weapon is crucial to defend against these attacks. In hybrid warfare, information is used to achieve an advantage in which our adversaries seek to weaken our society. In the end, the most effective weapon against information warfare is awareness, education, and training. This is why we are here. This is why we are being proactive in this domain. Welcome to Norwich University's Military Writers Symposium. So thanks for that. We showed that this morning and nobody clapped. So thank you. Appreciate that. Preparing leaders for the future has been Norwich's business for 200 years. It's what we do, and it's what we always will do. It is true that hybrid and cognitive warfare is in hyperdrive. However, sadly, many in our society are unaware. It's one thing to tell you about constructing a version of reality. It's quite the other to have you experience the process. As you guessed, Morgan Freeman was not real. But how long did it take for you to realize that? A battle to control your perception of reality is real, and we're here tonight to learn more about this important topic. So welcome to the 30th season of Norwich University's Military Writer Symposium. It is a pleasure to have each of you here. We have an engaging evening planned for you. But before I introduce university, before I introduce the university's provost and dean of the faculty, I would like to recognize and thank several people who make this event possible. So when I call your name, please stand and remain standing until all names are called. So President of Norwich, Lieutenant General John Broadmeadow, Norwich's Commandant, Brigadier General McCullough, Dr. Tara Kokarni, Associate Provost for Research, Dr. Mariana Boudrin, the 2024 Colby Award recipient, and all of our visiting authors, panelists, and student moderators, let's give them, go ahead, stand up if you're a student moderator. Give them a round of applause, thank you. <laughs> Great. I would also like to thank those alumni and supporters who are both on and off campus. 
who contribute your time, talents, and treasures to make this event possible. Particularly would like to thank the, Pr the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and the Department of Defense Cyber Institute whose generous support makes this possible. I'd also like to welcome those of you that are joining us on live stream, welcome. And we do know that we have a global audience and so we're glad that you're able to join us here. So a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please turn off your cell phones. And you'll notice two microphones on your left and to your right. These are for your questions towards the end of the panel. And we know every symposium there are multiple questions that students have and we welcome those. And the moderator at the end, towards the end of the panel, will let you know you can start making your way towards the microphone. Now it's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Norwich University's Provost and Dean of the Faculty, Brigadier General Karen Gaines, PhD, who has been very supportive of this event and has created an important milestones for information warfare at our institution. So ma'am, please join us on stage. Let's give a round of applause. This is awesome. This is my third event. This is my third time. And uh, I love it. I love watching you all come down. Um, it is just a fantastic opportunity for us to share this with you tonight, um, but for you as well. Uh, I, I never had this opportunity when I was at school and, and absorb it, take, take time, take time to listen and meet the authors throughout uh, tonight, but also tomorrow. So, but welcome and good evening. It's with great pride that we gather for the Military Writers Symposium, a hallmark academic event here at Norwich University, presented by the Peace and War Center and supported this year by the Department of Defense Cyber Institute. This symposium stands as the only one of its kind in any American university, and we are honored to host such a prestigious occasion. For over two decades, the Military Writers Symposium has brought together some of the most distinguished authors in the military intelligence, international affairs, to the heart of Vermont. This event is designed to educate, enlighten, challenge, and inspire. We are dedicated to tackling the most complex and critical security issues it advancing the discourse in a meaningful way. Founded in 1994 by W.E.B. Griffin and Carlo Deste, with the support of former, former Norwich University President M.G. Russell Todd, the symposium was envisioned as a unique forum to gather influential voices, fostering a deeper understanding of the global cha challenges that we face, in previous years, we've addressed pivotal topics such as cyber warfare, post-traumatic stress, the media's role in war, war's impact on families, environmental security, the Arctic power struggle, artificial intelligence, just to name a few. This year, we turn our focus to a subject of immense importance, perception wars, the battle to control reality. In a world where narratives shape outcomes, we are privileged to have some of the most, world's foremost experts here with us tonight, and you'll soon hear from them. But Norwich University is proud to be a thought leader in the realm of information warfare. Our programs ranging from undergraduate and graduate minors and certificates Simulations, research, internships, and innovative software applications demonstrate our commitment to understanding this vital area of study. The Military Writers Symposium continues to play a key role in educating our community on the ongoing battle to shape perceptions. It is now my distinct honor to introduce tonight's moderator, Colonel Steve Roberts, PhD, who is the Dean of the College of National Services, a professor of military science, and the commanding officer for the U.S. Army ROTC Pioneer Battalion here at Norwich University. A cyber warfare officer, 
Colonel Roberts was commissioned in 1998 after completing officer candidate school. With over 34 years of distinguished service in various leadership roles and deployments in support of global operations, he brings unparalleled expertise to tonight's discussion. So please join me in offering a warm welcome, Norwich welcome, to Colonel Roberts. So thank you, Dr. Gaines. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you emphasized the 34 years of service. Um, so thank you. Thank you, General Broadmeadow. Thank you, uh, again, uh, Travis Morris, you know, the trustees, donors, cadets, staff, um, and friends of Norwich University. This is just an incredible honor to, to stand before you with a panel made up of such incredible uh, subject matter experts and giants in the field uh, assembled before you. 30 years, amazing, huh? Um, so more importantly, you know, for the cadets and, and students, in just a few short months for some of you, these issues that we're going to talk about, you're going to be facing and leading the nation through. So before we, we get into the panel, you know, we talked about, you know, I'm a cyber officer, 35 years actually at this point, but, you know, some of the things that I've done in the past really talked about managing and protecting networks and data and, and systems and applications. And that work is still critical today. However, what we will discuss today is not a new risk per se, but one that is being exploited more extensively than ever before. Foreign and domestic actors want to change how you think in order to affect your behaviors. In essence, hacking you instead of the computers that I used to protect. Today, tools, capabilities, and cultural practices make these effect attacks more possible and more broader impacts than ever before. These actors want to alter your reality, to cause you to act in different ways, possibly to do nothing, perhaps to change your mind on a stance, maybe to aggravate you to anger, protest, or violence, or simply to distract you so that you're not aware of a more impact impactful events someplace else. Today's panel and discussion will delve into what has become a perception war, a war against your understanding of reality. This war attempts to manage your truth one battle, one event at a time, often for another's benefit. So with that framework in mind, let's meet tonight's distinguished panel. First up, Dr. Biliana Lilly, CISSP, cybersecurity and foreign policy expert, chair of Democratic Resilience Track, Warsaw Security Forum. Ms. Nina Jankowitz, author and researcher, former executive of the Disinformation Governance Board, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Dr. Zizi Papakirisi, a distinguished professor of communications and political science, University of Illinois, Chicago and then Colonel Curtis Boyd, U.S. Army retired, and also Norwich class of 1984, the director of training, doctrine, and Pro uh, proponency, JFK Special Warfare Center and School. Each of our accomplished panel members has a posted bio that I would encourage you to uh, review, but I will ask our esteemed experts to briefly introduce themselves at this time, starting with Dr. Lilly. To introduce myself? Yes, please. Thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Biliana Lilly. As, uh, as you already heard, I'm the chair of the Democratic Resilience Track of the Warsaw Security Forum. I uh, have been working um, on Russian information warfare and cybersecurity for almost 15 years now. I first started with a focus on uh, disarmament, nuclear disarmament and proliferation and nuclear terrorism. I worked at the United Nations in Geneva, but ever since um, the Russian interference in the U.S. elections in 2016, I saw how the U.S. government responded to Russia's interference, and I realized that that's, that's, that will be the modern, the type of modern warfare that the United States will have to face going forward. 
the Russians may not attack our homeland with tanks and missiles the way they are Ukraine, but they are attacking us in cyberspace, which they call information space through disinformation and cyber attacks. And I look forward to the panel and your questions later. Good evening, everyone. Nina Jankowitz. Uh, currently, I run a nonprofit called the American Sunlight Project that is aimed at increasing the cost of lies that undermine democracy. Uh, like Biliana, I come to this from a background of Russian information operations, and my first job out of graduate school was working on programs supporting democracy in Russia and Belarus. Uh, then the Euromaidan protests and the first invasion of Ukraine happened and I felt a draw to go over there, so ended up doing a Fulbright grant in Ukraine where I was advising the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there on strategic communications and did a, a bunch of research during the 2016 uh, election uh, and happened to be at the right place at the right time and uh, for the past decade or so have been involved in uh, attempting to analyze what is happening not only from our foreign adversaries as they manipulate our information environment, but looking at the ways those foreign adversaries manipulate the fissures in our society domestically. Um, and I think one of the most misunderstood things about disinformation is it's not just cut and dry fake news, right? Uh, it is things that people believe, real grievances that they hold that are being manipulated and amplified by foreign adversaries as well as people sometimes who want to make a buck to sell something to remain in power, these sorts of narratives. Um, and I do believe, like Biliana, that this is one of the most pressing issues of our society today and I, I couldn't be more pleased to be here discussing it with you tonight. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my background is, and training is in social psychology and I study the social and political consequences of media and newer media and emerging technologies including the internet. Um, I started studying the internet almost 30 years ago when it was a very small medium and nobody really used it. In the US, less than 5% of the population globally, less than 1%, most of my classmates thought I was crazy to focus on it. I went on the job market in 2000, and during interviews I would be asked, you know, why should we care about this weird thing? And I would say, well, because in a few years it's gonna be as ubiquitous as electricity. It's gonna feel normal, part of your every day. And they would laugh, uh, and then I would be asked, um, well, you know, certainly this is not going to affect um, journalism and newspapers, and I would say, well, you know, not the news, but you know, you're not gonna be reading the, the news on a piece of paper anymore. And again, <laughs> I would get laughed at. And I would also get asked about Amazon, which was a very tiny company <laughs> back then, just trading books. Um, and people would say, well, you know, they can't really possibly get anywhere. Um, and I would say, well, you know, no, but with distribution centers, they could. So it's been, it's been a, I, I have no idea why, why I decided as a 20 year old to focus on the internet, but it's one of the um, smartest and funnest decisions that I made in my life. I've been studying emerging media since then, um, starting with the web and then blogs and then social media platforms. I've written about um, how we present ourselves online, how we become social, or asocial or social in a different way online. And I also have written extensively about um, social media and how they affect uh, our democracies and um, the political process and the civic landscape by appealing um, to our emotions. Um, I'll stop here. I look forward to the conversation. My most recent work includes uh, working with the International Panel on the Information Environment Advising on Disinformation. So 40 years ago, I was out there, and here I am today, and I would never imagine I would be on the stage talking to you. Not at all. But I couldn't be more proud of the last 40 years and the experiences I've had as a result of being there. And so you need to stay the course, remain committed, and continue to be all that you can possibly be. I offer that um, I, when I was here and we had to make a decision during our senior year to determine what we wanted to do with the rest of our lives. And I had spent all my years previous uh, participating on that field right across the street and I thought, hey, Norwich offered this great education program where you could stay and be a grad assistant. 
and I'm going to do that. I'm going to be a coach. And um, so sure enough, I signed up, was waiting to hear. Clock's ticking, clock's ticking. I don't hear anything. ROTC's bugging me. Hey, you need to decide. Are you going to camp? Are you going to camp? So I said, all right. And who was here at the time? Some of you may remember him. General Friedovich was here at that time. He was Captain Friedovich. And he said, we got something for you to do. You need to be an instrument. And you need to sign up and do it now. And so I said, all right, sir, I'll go ahead and give it a whirl. And so I had, did it that day, and no kidding, the next day I got the scholarship. So I could have been a coach that next day. But I'll tell you what, the greatest surprise of my life just occurred not two months ago. I got a phone call from a teammate. He said, hey, Kurt, 40 years, we're celebrating. I said, what? What are we celebrating? 26th, come up. Come up for what? The most successful football team. Oh, no kidding. So I stayed an extra year as a gold bar recruiter and got to coach that team. Right? Got to coach linebackers and defensive ends, and it was the greatest, day, greatest experience of my life, and then I entered the military. And you know, all the rest is history, but nonetheless, let me walk you through that real quick, and then we'll get on. So you're going to have to make this choice, and I'm telling you, it's not a bad one, because I also brought my bride to Norwich. She came here and visited often, and she's still my bride today. So that's one of my best accomplishments. But the other is, of course, spending 27 years in the Army and loving every day of it. And you will too. Because you build a camar camaraderie that cannot be replaced anywhere, anyhow. And I'll tell you, this particular network, there's not a place I've gone that, where there has not been a Norwich grad, and that person is absolutely excelling. You can tell in a room who that is. And, and it's, it's, it's so heartwarming and rewarding to see it, particularly when they're young people, because then you immediately know who you can count on, who you've seeded the environment with leaders that can start moving the ball, right, and make a difference. It's absolutely extraordinary. So 27 years in the military, seven of them spent in infantry, loved every day of that. Camaraderie, we went to war, did the whole Panama thing, jumping up planes in combat, really cool, right? And then I said, hey, what happened? I said, hey, I gotta lose my brain, I need to get smart. So they said, hey, I can be a psychological operations guy and go to grad school. I said, hey, this is great, I'll do it. So I sign up, what happens, the first thing happens to me. Land on a drop zone, break my back. Whole world changes, right? Means now, I definitely have to use this. I'm not doing anything else but that. So the next 20 years was absolutely spent dealing with it. So 20 years moved by, and what occurred in that time period? The unit that I signed up for, that I became the group commander for, had not been to combat since the first Gulf War. And I looked at that unit and I said, you all need to be part of this experience. We all need to participate with everything that's special operations and need to deliver, right, and create a difference. And so, 2007, that unit went back to war and it hasn't looked back, right, because that war is not over. War in the information space is real, it's every day constant, right? And our leadership has realized it, right? They're coming and telling me, right? And telling the things that I do now as the Director of Training and Doctrine and Proponency at the Special Warfare Center that we need to strap it on. We need to be part of the Army solution in the future, right? No kidding, deliver a real information advantage. And we need to bring with us cyber, electronic warfare, OPSEC, deception, right? And deliver that, right, to the warfighter, right? So, therefore, you know, we don't have the problems that many of our partners do. And we need to go with partners, right? And that's the other great experience in Norwich, right? We have allies. We cannot win the future fight without our allies. We are not gonna go around the world and be alone. This is not something we would do on our own. So I expect um, you all to continue and embrace them, and they'll embrace you and make a difference. So, thanks. Thank you, panelists. Next, uh, to help frame our conversation tonight, I wanted to outline just three examples of perception wars. Within each of these examples, I encourage you to ask yourself, who is being manipulated, who is the manipulator, and for what purpose? So the first case, for years, cigarettes were promoted to the public. As an example, during World War II, soldiers were provided free cigarettes with meals increasing strong addictions and habits for decades. Despite evidence mounting that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer, 
Tobacco companies hired scientists to publish research that minimized the link between smoking and cancer. Later, they promoted filtered cigarettes or healthier alternatives despite the same health risks. Eventually, tobacco companies lost court settlements and were required to pay billions of dollars in compensation and fund anti-smoking campaigns. However, these settlements came after decades of misinformation. Today, smoking remains a leading cause of more than 8 million annual preventable deaths globally, despite science telling you that cigarettes are bad for you. The next example, after the 2020 presidential election concluded, false claims of widespread voter fraud, ballot tampering, conspiracy theories about rigged election results, and mail-in voting were promoted. Both domestic actors and foreign adversaries, including Iran and Russia, pushed these narratives. This effort eroded public confidence in U.S. voting, the electoral process, the new administration, and led to the January 6th Capitol riot, which caused more than 100 injuries and nine deaths. True voter fraud has been found to occur only in 30 out of 1 billion votes, making it exceedingly rare and having no statistical impact on poll outcomes. Yet this misinformation campaign continues to polarize and confuse the political landscape today. More recently, the early 2024 claim that Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, were stealing and eating pets had been thoroughly debunked, despite Springfield police and city officials confirming that no such activity had been received, political candidates later in 2024 promoted and embellished these claims to a national audience. This misinformation led to increased racial and anti-immigrant tensions, bomb threats, school evacuations, increased police presence, higher taxpayer costs, and even outsiders coming to Springfield to save pets while promoting violence against the legal Haitian immigrant community. These are just a few examples, but they provide a backdrop for our discussion from corporations, political actors, conspiracy promoters, to Russian and Iranian adversaries in this case. Each of these actors had a need, each had an intended audience, and each initiated an attack on reality. The victim is the intended target, either directly or indirectly, impacted by the reality attack. Unfortunately, the reality is altered, the, excuse me, the, the reality that is altered is also the victim. Since once altered, it tends to have a long-lasting or permanent effect. So with that backdrop, the first few questions we'll ask for all the, panels to an all the panelists to answer. Um, just anybody chime in. So the first one, how do you define the concept of perception wars? And why is it increasingly relevant in today's information environment? Anybody can answer. Sure. Happy to go first and uh, get us started. Um, I love the term perception uh, wars. It's a very, it's a very elegant and an also very contemporary way of describing a phenomenon and a human tendency that's been with us for a while. So I would define um, perception wars as, you know, if I wanted to be very polite, I would say persuasion. Um, if I wanted to be very blunt, I would say propaganda. Um, and in some ways, you know, persuasion and propaganda are twins. You know, propaganda is maybe the the ugly twin of persuasion. Why is it um, essential that we look at perception wars in today's information environment? Because we live in societies that are mass, uh, larger than we've ever existed in. Uh, and it's increasingly difficult, yet it is essential for us to be able to experience um, and to be able to view and understand parts of the world that we don't have direct access to. We've always wanted to do that as human beings. You know, it's probably one of the reasons, you know, why we invented gestures and language, because we wanted to come together to persuade each other. Um, and the means of propaganda and persuasion um, have varied, even though the goals may have remained the same. 
Um, so starting from you know scrolls to um, to 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 the Bible to religion, and I'm not saying that all religion is propaganda or persuasion, but it is a way. You know, some of it presents a way of presenting a particular story, a particular ethos to a group of people, to then print, um, to photography, to film, to music, to radio, to TV. These are all ways of bringing us closer and helping us experience realities that we can't um, get to see firsthand, creating, helping create um, the pictures in our heads, as Walter Lippmann, uh, political scientist, uh, philosopher, um, once said. I think with social media, um, we're getting that, and we're also getting the sense that we're getting perhaps um, a little bit more immediacy and intimacy, and it feels a little bit like we're um, getting to witness an event, um, uh, uh, witness these events with a little bit more instantaneity. But they're in, and you know, in that closeness, in that proximity, um, lies a trap because often that proximity can be an illusion. You know, we have to remember that we're not viewing those events for ourselves. Um, we're viewing them through a very tiny keyhole using a lens, you know, that somebody else is operating. So we're using, we're viewing these things through somebody else's eyes, through somebody else's perception. And that's something that we'll have to teach ourselves to, to read and interpret and, and filter. I would add that perception right. wars are um, actual deliberate strategic effort from our main adversaries, China, Iran, North Korea, Russia especially, to shape public opinion. And they're part of modern warfare and the modern warfare doctrines of these countries. In Russia, they're, for, uh, they're a part of a doctrine called information warfare or information war or information confrontation. In the case of China, it's a doctrine called cognitive warfare. And what's really important in this case is that that particular type of warfare is not just targeted at our military or our decision makers, it is targeted at every single member of our society. So every single one of us can be a target, whether you work for the military, whether you become a civilian, you are one of the targets of that war. Curtis? Sure. So in a word, feeling. Perception war is about feeling. So to affect a particular target audience in the business of psychological operations would be about the senses and tapping into that. Um, those that have been to Afghanistan know that working with our partners over time, we shared feelings. At a particular point in that confrontation, our Afghan partners did not want us to go out the wire. They felt it was their job. They knew what sacrifices the American military was paying there. And that was feeling, right? And that was their perception and our perception, and we need to unify those um, as we go forward in the future. And I'll just I'll bring up the rear by saying, you know, we've said perception, persuasion, feeling. I think the elegance of the term, uh, you know, Per perception war is that we often are stuck when we're talking about disinformation and information warfare broadly on truth or falsity. Uh, but as I said before, what our adversaries are often doing, and, and the most kind of advanced disinformers domestically as well, is they're preying on our emotions, as Curtis has just alluded to. So if there's one thing I want you to take away as you're navigating today's information environment, it's that if you feel yourself getting emotional, you're probably being manipulated, right? The most engaging content on the internet is the most enraging content very frequently. And the algorithms on social media platforms are preying on that emotion for you. 
Uh, and what someone might interpret as um, just a very you know, normal, everyday occurrence, another person, in, through their lens, might perceive it to be something very emotionally triggering, right? Um, so remembering that is really important, and, and I do like this perception term as a way uh, to describe the difficulty of responding to disinformation, influence operations, and information operations more broadly. Thank you. So the next question, you know, we, we mentioned social media here at least once, but maybe we can expand upon that. What role do, do, do we see social media platforms play in shaping public perception, and how have they changed the nature of modern conflict, at least in the last couple of years? I'll, I'll start that one. I think um, we get a lot of questions, I'm sure each one of us has dealt with this many times, where people are saying, well, politicians have always lied. You know, we've always had uh, this sort of information competition among, among adversaries. What's different about today? Um, and the difference is the speed and scale at which those lies can travel, and the fact that they can be targeted at the populations that are most vulnerable to them at any given point through targeted advertising. So one exercise that I do with my graduate students at Syracuse is that we buy Facebook ads because a lot of people don't recognize the degree to which you can target someone, not only based on their zip code, but based on uh, their likes, their dislikes, what pages they interact with. If they've bought an ad, uh, bought, a, bought a piece of, um, bought something from a Facebook ad before, uh, you can do it based on age, gender, all sorts of different things. And it can be a very, very segmented audience. And our adversaries know how to do that too. Now it's not as simple as it used to be with Russia buying ads in rubles, um, but there are ways that they can contract PR agencies to get around those rules. Uh, they are using things like Facebook groups or Telegram and WhatsApp groups to identify different segments of society that might be vulnerable to that emotional manipulation, right? Um, and that's what social media provides. We used to just have one giant megaphone right? Uh, where, you know, if you got on the nightly news, you, you reached everyone. Um, you might all be familiar with uh, Russia's operation to say that AIDS was a U.S. military project, right? Uh, it, it gained some traction, but can you imagine what that might have looked like in the age of social media when they didn't have to print pamphlets and identify, you know, useful idiots through which to, uh, to send that messaging? It, it could have been a lot more successful. Um, so that's the, the real danger, I think, of social media. But I will also say it's not a bad thing, right? We've seen social media also uh, uphold democratic ideals, unite people who are standing up against autocratic regimes. And that constant tension is something that democracies find themselves in the middle of. I could add to that. In addition, social media brings the battlefield to our phones. And we can clearly see that um, in the example of the, the Arab Spring and more recently in the example of Ukraine. The, um, I don't think the Russian government expected the type of mobilization and unity that we saw from the European Union and from the United States in support of Ukraine. For the first time, we actually discussed and implemented measures to decouple and um, break our dependence, energy dependence of Europe to Russia. For the first time, we introduced such harsh sanctions against the Russian government. For the first time, we started sending massive amounts of support to Ukraine. And I think this was partially possible because of all the images that our constituencies, our population saw. Mass graves with burned civilians from Bucha. Um, young Russians literally massacring civilian Ukrainians. I think that brought the horror of war to each of us and it democratized the battlefield. Yeah, instead of necessarily bringing it to our homes, it actually brought it to our handheld devices, right? Exactly. I can quickly add something if that's okay. Um, so in the, in the previous century, in the 1960s, um, a couple of uh, political scientists, the Langs, um, decided to run a study on MacArthur Day Parade in Chicago. And they wanted to observe how people experienced events uh, based on their mode of engagement. Um, 
so they compared the experience of people who were present in the parade um, in the streets of Chicago to welcome um, General MacArthur to the experience then of people who were watching uh, the event on television. Um, and they had conversations, you know, with people, bystanders who were attending the parade in person, and then also had compared their findings to the conversations that they had with people who were watching the event from the comfort of their living rooms on their TVs. It was very interesting. It was almost as if um, the two groups were observing very different events. Um, one might have thought, you know, that people on the streets would have had like a m more immediate um, experience, but they didn't. They reported that the event felt disorganized, that the general was impersonal, uh, that there didn't seem to be a purpose to the event. On the contrary, people watching the event on television, well, they said that it was a very organized, cheerful event that the general seemed very warm and personable. Um, I'm telling this story because it's a, it's a classical um, study of political science and it shows how there's events um, and then there's the stories uh, that we tell about events. There's a story that we tell about events and then there's also multiple stories that we may um, tell about events and the texture of those stories changes depending on the media platform that we use. Um, you know, there's the, there's the actual experience of attending um, a MAGA rally and then the, there's the experience of um, reading about that rally through Truth Social or through a different medium or through Fox News or through CNN. You get a number of different stories. Um, I was inspired by this study, and a few years ago, and you mentioned uh, the Arab Spring and a number of mo movements that we thought at the time were encouraged and enabled by social media. So I studied um, uh, the Arab Spring. I also studied the Occupied Movement and a variety of um, the Indignados movements um, in Europe, both online and offline, um, and saw similar traces uh, of, again, the event and then different stories um, of different intensity being told about that event offline, online. So the Arab Spring, for instance, especially in its first um, uh, unfolding of events that led to the resignation of Hosni Mubarak, in the United States and on Twitter, it played like a very happy revolution that happened instantaneously overnight. And we know that's not true, because there's no, no revolution occurs overnight. Revolutions, historically, are long, as the cultural uh, scholar Raymond Williams says. And they have to be long in order to attain meaning. But much of the traffic on Twitter contained our own projections and hopes about the revolution. We wanted it to be, you know, this, this dream of democracy and this, you know, this also this very Western and American dream of democracy. But streams of activity online were supportive of that, except for the streams that came from within Egypt, uh, within Cairo, from the streets, and also as compared to the conversations that people were having on Tahrir Square, which were enthusiastic, yes, but also a little bit skeptical given that the region has seen a lot of upheaval that has led, has not always led to happy results. So I would say, I mean, I, I agree with all of you and I think when we talk about feeling and emotion and emotional uh, manipulation, I would say this is absolutely something that's augmented and amplified by social media. I would not use the word emotion though because emotion means that you're happy, you're sad, you're mad. Um, uh, I agree with Nina, if you feel like you're being emotionally manipulated, I would just slightly alter that and say, there's a different, different level of intensity that social media invite. And they make it seem like you need to engage right away. Uh, and sometimes this makes it difficult for us to, you know, to have the, the logical stamina to just kind of step back and think clearly and carefully about what it is we're reading, and quite often it may be um, disinformation. I was a little on the long side. I'll <laughs> save time for the, right. for the next one. I'll be quick. So an army imperative, 
um, in our doctrine is see, sense, and understand the enemy and friendly operational environment. And earlier today in the discussions about misdisinformation, people talked about how they've, and they've been analyzing the environment and laying out the various factors that kind of give you visibility of that. It's the same thing here as it pertains to social media. If you see what you see at home, you probably won't see the same thing when you're not home. So just be clued in to recognize the differences. Um, a quick story we hosted some time ago when I was um, at another, working for uh, Johns Hopkins, we hosted a uh, irregular warfare forum and we had some State Department reps in. Um, one of the State Department reps from Iraq had made a point about walking outside the embassy one day and what he saw is a bunch of kids, you know, kind of playing and he didn't understand what they were doing and I went over and took a look and they were playing with a cell phone. And his point to everybody in that auditorium was that those kids playing with that cell phone knew more about that phone than anybody in that room, mm. right, with us that day. Because it was the one phone and they were all sharing it and they all wanted to get up in the, you know, up in the, up in the air with it and, you know, hear something, you know, get all the best, best features out of it as they could. It was uh, quite eye-opening. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so next, uh, what we'll do is we'll ask some rather direct questions to, to each of you. So I'll, I'll actually start with uh, Dr. Biliana Lilly. You know, based upon your research, how are nation states like Russia and China weaponizing information to control perceptions globally? And maybe talk about some of the effective strategies that state and non-state actors are, are utilizing to manipulate public perception. That's a huge question. I'm how, sorry. how much time do you have? I mean, I mean. So um, the way Russia and China are weaponizing um, information, it's a part of their military doctrines, and there is a state budget for um, specifically for shaping narratives of other countries. The channels that they're using are typically state-sponsored media, traditional media, but also social media, and um, media in different countries that they are targeting with the particular message. Um, specifically with regards to what has been very effective, it's very hard to measure effectiveness. And that's probably one of the biggest problems of this field. We had a wonderful keynote today, but because we're in the Chatham House rule, I can't attribute, can, cannot attribute it. But the idea was, because it is hard to measure the effect of this particular weapon of warfare, because disinformation has become a weapon of warfare, it is really difficult to introduce policies, effective policies against it, because we just don't know how powerful it really is. But some of the the most likely, most effective measures that we've seen are sponsorship of political parties, direct sponsorship of political parties that align with the particular um, interests of the, the state. In the case of Russia, we have examples, recent examples of politicians in the Netherlands, GUK, and Brussels and other places being directly sponsored uh, through Russian money to alter poli the domestic politics of these countries and to affect European parliamentary elections. We also have um, evidence of actual influencers in the United States that have been sponsored by foreign nation states, and I think that will be a particularly effective and powerful tool um, that has the potential to manipulate our perceptions because we tend to trust the narratives that come out of people that we trust and, fo and fo follow and admire. And if those are influencers that we already follow, then we're more likely to believe what they're saying, even if, if it actually is um, disinformation campaign sponsored by the Russian government. So I pointed those two. Yeah. So not only if, if you're following that influencer, but if other people are following that influencer, you tend to say, well, you know, they have a lot of followers, so I'm, I need to listen to them, right? That bias as well. Yeah. So, so Nina, you know, what, what can governments and civil society do to counteract some of this different disinformation without, especially in the Western society, how do we prevent you know, compromising freedom of speech considerations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and here I'm going to tell a little bit of a personal story for those that uh, missed my talk earlier today. Um, as was noted in my bio, I spent a short time in the Biden administration at the Department of Homeland Security in a role uh, called the Executive Director of the Disinformation Governance Board, which is a very scary sounding name, right? Um, but actually what I was meant to do was bring together different parts of DHS, which is a bit of a Frankenstein of a government agency um, with a lot of 
different portfolios within it and make sure that we were coordinating on responses to disinformation. And I don't know how many of you know this, but FEMA um, in the news recently, part of DHS, and they're among the most advanced in responding to disinformation in our government. And I wanted to bring those lessons to bear for colleagues who are doing customs and border protection or uh, at the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. You get the idea. Unfortunately, when my appointment was announced, people on the fringes of the political spectrum said that I was going to be a minister of truth and that I was going to have the power to decide what was true and false online and I was going to censor people and a massive campaign of harassments and threats against me and my family ensued. And unfortunately, the administration decided to kind of crumple in the face of those lines, lies and uh, I decided to resign. I was a couple weeks away from giving birth to my son who is now uh, two and a half. And um, I think this is a very real tension, the tension that you've outlined here. This idea that somehow by responding to disinformation, we will be trampling on the rights we hold near and dear. And actually the ironic thing about the campaign against me and the Disinformation Governance Board was that in the very charter of the board, which is a public document now, you can look it up, it says that one of the intentions of the board was to set the guardrails so that when DHS was responding to disinformation, we were doing so in a way that protected civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy. Uh, very ironic. So um, that being said, I think there's a lot that, that civil society and the government can do that has nothing to do with censoring speech. Um, most of my work has focused on information literacy, building information literacy. If we look at our allies in Estonia, in Ukraine, in Poland, uh, many of these countries that have been dealing with the threat of Russian disinformation for much longer than we've even recognized that it's a problem, they have been investing in building up citizen resilience in, in not only showing people, yes, Russia is doing some bad things in the information sphere, but, uh, but that, you know, <laughs> these social media platforms that we all rely on to communicate with our friends and family and share pics of our cats and dogs and babies, that uh, they're not always all good all of the time. And that sort of, um, of knowledge, I think, is part of being a good citizen in the digital age. And I know you're all meant to be kind of uh, ideal citizens here at Norwich, right? So I hope you're taking all of that to heart. Um, another thing that I think you've got going for you that civil society and government both play a role in is open source investigations. I've talked to a few students who are involved in, in OSINT um, and those sorts of uh, investigations. They have played a, an enormous role in our ability to respond to disinformation, particularly when we look at conflicts uh, in Ukraine, what's going on in Sudan, even uh, in the Israel-Hamas war right now, with the footage that's being uploaded constantly to social media ahead of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, I was working for a, a UK-based NGO at that point, we were able to track the fact that Russia had battalions of troops waiting on the borders in Belarus, in, in Western Russia, to invade Ukraine. They had, uh, you know, the, the blood units there, which was an indication that there was going to be conflict. We saw on the train tracks, Belarusians uh, sending or, you know, videoing, you know, full on, uh, I don't know anything about, I'm showing my whole uh, lack of uh, military education here, but all the military equipment on its way in and my friends uh, and colleagues who are able to identify that were able to pause those videos, show the direction that they were traveling, uh, look at the numbering on the tanks and say, oh, this, this came from this part of Russia, far away, they have no real reason to be here, right? And using that open source footage that civil society groups were able to identify, supported by declassification efforts that the UK and US government put forward, we were able to say to the media and to the public, Russia is about to invade Ukraine. They're about to be lying and saying uh, that, you know, this is why they're invading Ukraine to defend Russian speakers. They're going to pretend that there are car bombings happening. And lo and behold, all of it happened. And the coalition that we were able to muster that Biliana talked about before was, in, I think, in large part due to that open source effort in coordination, not direct coordination, but certainly, you know, amplification with those declassification efforts coming from the government. And that is something that all of you in your research here at Norwich, in whatever you go on to do 
in your military or civilian careers can play a role in. And that's extraordinarily empowering. And that has nothing to do with trampling on, on freedom of expression. In fact, it's putting more good information out there. And that is the sort of work that I wish that I could have done for the United States government. But uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> awesome. So, so Zizi, you next. Uh, you know, how, how do you see the architecture of social media amplify emotional engagement and influence uh, the perception of reality? So we talked a little bit about that earlier of, you know, if I feel excited, eh, maybe I need to pay attention. <laughs> um, thank you for asking me the, you know, this question in such a thoughtful way. Um, I, I, I like talking about technology as architecture because it's, um, it helps me describe uh, the subtle uh, but important ways in which technology makes a difference. And to also relate how, you know, we often tend to place all of the blame on social media, and that's not the case. Uh, you, know, you know, the internet is not a magical space that can render, you know, manifest democracy magically or, you know, take away, destroy democracy on its own. You know, when we enter the internet, when we enter these social media platforms, uh, we bring our problems with us. You know, there's no sign upon entering Facebook that says, hey, you know, you're, you're getting on Facebook now. Leave all your stereotypes and your hate speech behind. <laughs> Behave. Um, but there are um, aspects of the design of the social media, but of their architecture, that um, make a difference. You know, as Melvin Kronzberg says, social media technology uh, is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Um, so what is it exactly? So think about the architecture of a movie theater and what it is about its design, um, the darkness, uh, the seating, that makes you go silent when you walk in. Or think about the atmosphere of a crowded bar and what it is about that setup of the place that wants you to go in with your friends and have a beer and have a good time and contrast that to the setup then of a cozy restaurant where you might go um, on a date or an intimate conversation. So it's those subtle yet very important differences uh, that I'm referring to that then you see manifest on a platform like Twitter or X. What do you do with a platform that, you know, the minute um, that, you know you set your foot on that platform, you're invited to opine, to express your opinion. Is there a way to avoid that? How about Facebook? You know, how do you how do you behave on a platform that invites you to talk about how you spent your day? Or think about Instagram with its use of filters, which have you know made Instagram uh, popular from the very beginning. And that inherently invites you to present, you know, a very carefully manicured version of who you are. You know, you, you want to use those filters. You want to play with them. Contrast that to TikTok, which has a very, um, very different aesthetic that invites one to present a more, you know, self-deprecating, uh, humorous version uh, of themselves. Um, I'll close by saying this, and this connects to information and understanding and interpreting the world and, you know, listening and asking the right questions. A um, um, long time ago, Susan Zontag wrote an essay about photojournalism, uh, because at the time, photojournalism was a new medium. And it was a very interesting thing for people who had been reading descriptions and events to actually see a photograph of these things. They really felt that they were immersing themselves into the experience in a way that's very, it's hard for you to imagine, for all of us to imagine, but it's very similar to uh, immersing yourself uh, through a virtual reality, uh, to an experience or a world through a virtual reality uh, mean, means or modes. Um, and um, Zontag wrote, um, you know, she was commenting uh, because a lot of people felt like because they were watching the photograph they, and they had seen what happened, they knew what happened. And she wanted to draw this difference between seeing and knowing. And seeing is not the same as knowing. Mm -hmm. And to that end, you know, she said, yes, you know, you've seen, doesn't mean you know, you have the right to an opinion, it doesn't mean you've earned that right. Um, this is something that I think um, 
uh, social media often encourage us to do, you know, to, to opinionate, um, to, to talk about things that we don't fully um, understand well yet. You know, sometimes this can get, get us into trouble. Yeah, and the next question, uh, you know, is for, for Colonel Boyd. You know, from a military perspective, how does the control of information impact modern warfare and national security, uh, especially on, on a battlefield that we may face in the near future? Sure. So control of information on the modern battlefield clearly would make it easier, right? Very simple. Um, in that, your target population, if it has less conduits of information to it, then obviously we then can narrow our focus um, and, and target and affect that. So if you go back to early days of Iraq and Afghanistan, in many respects, the focus was eliminate the conduits of information to the Iraqi and the, the adversaries um, in the Afghan sector. Um, so therefore, we had, of course, the upper hand and we were able to recreate that. You know, at, at, at a particular advantage. Um, the other, the other thing to consider is the, the notion of, you know, trying to control information is almost uh, impossible, right? And and so therefore, do we not still try? And invariably, because of the cost, um, as it as it pertains to infrastructure and and so forth, if you're going to wage in war and continue with the tact of we need to eliminate this this from our adversary and gain our certain advantage. Um, it may not be worth that cost, cost. So as we move forward, what the conversations that are being had now is that in the information fight, it is the first fight. So we are fighting now with information and we need to win it. And the reason why we want to win it is of course because we don't want to invest blood and treasure in what follows after. And, and so the the conversations that are similarly being had is this, no kidding, earlier today someone quoted Sun Tzu and his best quote that ties to this is the acme of skill is to win without fighting. And, and so if we're you know, attributing fighting to some type of physical act, then maybe, maybe not. But if we attribute it to what is an information act, then maybe we can in fact win and of course stand by what Sun, Sun Tzu asks of us. Yeah, so maybe the follow-up there is, you know, our military is very good at hitting a certain target, a certain time, very short-term targets. You know, we have not done the information campaign or information war all that effectively. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Russia is, is, has an advantage in that, that respect. So, so how do we counter that? Right. And so, the, of course, the, the focus always needs to be on your hardest task. And war fighting is clearly going to be the hardest task in combat. So we need to focus our forces on that. But meanwhile, that doesn't say that we're not doing anything to the left or right of that, and that they call that competition. And, and so can we still create dilemmas, create difficulties, um, decision-making challenges, and so forth for our adversary left or right of combat? We absolutely can. And, and those tasks are ongoing, right? We, and it's not just something that's the province of what is SOF. It is essentially the entire army and the entire joint force is engaged in this. It's similarly, obviously, as we discussed earlier today, this notion of whole of government, whole of nation, and everybody needs to pitch in. And of course, that's obviously something we're trying to reinforce as well. Okay. So I'll tee up another question here, but in the meantime, there's two microphones on either side. Please start lining up quietly as we uh, as I ask one last question here. So, you know, as we, as we look to the future here, especially in the next five to seven years, how do you see the future of information warfare evolving? And how does the U.S. in particular and Western societies in particular evolve with that? All right, so I'll go first and go, go quick. So a few lessons of information warfare up to now. One of them, just for your knowledge, is within Army doctrine, information warfare is something the enemy does. Um, on the Army side, we conduct influence or military information support operations and a whole host of supporting activities as it pertains to that. Um, with regard to other particular lessons, um, one of which that, that applies to this is in 2007, the first 
and it existed then doctrinally. It was okay. We had an irregular warfare task force. It stood up, essentially brought all the irregular warfare or the information warfare capabilities together under one roof. And that provided what General Carter was talking, you know, talking about earlier today, this notion of a capacity to maneuver in the information space. And why is that? Because ordinarily where you find practitioners of information is embedded within the command staff somewhere. And it's not given a command position. And so a commander can talk to another commander about effects he or she wants to make on the battlefield. And so having an information task force akin to another task force offers that commander the capacity to do that maneuver in the information space. And that's where we're at. The other thing that we're exploring is more often than not because it's difficult to play um, the whole notion of effects in the human dimension. You know, how do people really react to these messages and how do we capture it, how do we measure it? And, and so the conversations that are being had now are about warfighting exercises and CPXs and other C CTCs, these, these combat training center rotations, where we begin the fight to the left. We start today. And today, first engagements begin, begin in the information space. And so we're either being attrited and affected from disinformation and misinformation and or we're delivering the same to our adversary. And we're calculating those. And so when that warfighting commander comes on board and we say, hey, this is the environment in which we prepared for you to be successful, right, in your first physical fight, right? Because un unfortunately, we kind of failed and we couldn't stop it. And so we're going to move on, you know, to combat. All right, thanks. Anybody else? I'm worried about two particular trends. First is how our adversaries will weaponize technologies, especially AI and use of deepfakes, to increase, rapidly increase and disseminate the volume of disinformation or strategic messaging. I'm also worried about, and we've started to see those trends, about the proliferation of different local assets that our adversaries are using, such as local politicians, influencers, activists who are being paid to to um, protest on behalf of different governments without even knowing it. So I'm worried about those two trends, weaponizing technology and weaponizing actual local assets, which would, both of those will lead to making it harder for the United States for us to detect foreign influence operations, foreign disinformation operations. Yeah, so in other words, impacting the people that you trust, the communities that you trust, and that's amplifying right. a message that's coming from a foreign adversary. Uh, yeah, I would, I would piggyback on that and say that m many of my worries um, that when I think about the next five years, I think unfortunately are already here. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion of, of generative AI during this election season, and there's some discussion right now saying that it was overblown, those fears were overblown. And I, uh, I don't think so, and I mentioned this this morning, and I'll say it again now, we're less than 30 days out from our election. Uh, if I were Russia, China, or Iran, and I had the technology to put a convincing deepfake audio video uh, or what have you out there, photo even, um, I would not be doing it until either right now or potentially in the transition period where we're waiting for either the results to be uh, counted and announced or the results to be certified. That is when that's going to be most effective. So I'm worried about that because we know these technologies are open source and we know our adversaries have been cultivating them. And then one other thing that I'm, I'm worried about, and this has, I think, particular significance for military communities because Russia has uh, deployed these sorts of campaigns before, are gendered and sexualized campaigns that are uh, enabled by AI. I'm sure you've all heard about uh, deepfake pornography, non-consensual intimate imagery. Russia has consistently used sexual campaigns against opposition figures, activists, etc. abroad. And I can think of no better way for our adversaries to undermine the chain of command than by unleashing a photorealistic deepfake porn video of a, a woman uh, in command in the military. So this is something that I always bring up to make everyone squirm in their seats a little bit. Uh, but it is a reality of today's internet. And just to kind of bring it home a little bit more, 98% uh, of the deep fake videos that are online today are non-consensual intimate imagery and 99% of those are of women. So this is a real problem and even if our Congress hopefully passes a law uh, criminalizing this uh, stuff, Russia's not going to listen to that. So we have to think about the ways that we can push back 
prevent and mitigate uh, and think proactively about that. And I think it's only a matter of time, particularly if we do end up having uh, a woman commander in chief. Um, um, I'll just add that in terms of uh, vessels, communicative vessels of um, disinformation, yes, you know, deep fakes, deep fakes and all forms of um, synthetic media will continue to be important, influencers as well. Um, I'm concerned about uh, memes mm -hmm. and also disinformation attacks disguised as humor. Uh, becoming more prevalent, you know, humor can be a very effective veneer disguise for, you know, persuasive or propaganda attempts. And, um, and also virtual avatars. I'm also a little bit concerned this doesn't have to do with, you know, a mode of disinformation, uh, with the fact that we're already quite polarized, so these attacks are falling on very fertile ground. Um, Polarization goes and works in circles. I can talk about more about that if you're interested. So we're bound to cycle out of uh, polarization, the, the current polarization cycle. But I mean, how quickly um, <laughs> we'll be able to do that is um, is a different question. Depends on a set of um, systemic factors. Thank you. So we'll open up to to the really hard questions now. <laughs> So uh, on my right, uh, first up. Good evening. Can you come a little closer to oh, the mic? Yeah, to the microphone or just to the? I think, you're, I, think I hear you. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Edward Cahill. I was wondering what are ways we could fight back or like what's an offense, offensive strategy we could have to counteract these disinformation campaigns and counteract this information warfare because it seems like there's a lot of strategies that are being laid out against us and not a lot of things we can necessarily do to fight back. Um, I would personally uh, advocate for investing, and I know this doesn't always kind of squarely align with uh, what you all may be doing in your careers, but uh, certainly investing in, in democratic resilience, right? Um, the issues that Russia, China, Iran are weaponizing here in the United States are issues of governance, issues of non-responsiveness uh, of government, uh, trust in government. Um, frankly, we need to govern better. Um, and uh, when you look at the societies that are most resilient toward disinformation, you know, not only do they invest in things like public media, education, information literacy, um, but they also have highly responsive and highly trusted government. And I know that's not a very satisfying answer because it's not something that we can just put in doctrine and implement, um, but that is how you build resilient societies, and that's coming a little bit with my kind of former democracy promoter uh, hat on but um, it's one of the things that I think we need not only to fight back about uh, against disinformation, but to, to make sure that you know, we are not uh, needlessly going to war in times when we don't need to. Uh, I think the solution needs to be um, involved in part regulatory, um, get social media companies to think more seriously about loopholes that you know, they've uh, left open. Uh, behavioral, so on our end, we need to teach ourselves behaviors. I, I think we need to just remember uh, what we learned in school about just basic critical thinking uh, and not rushing to judgment. And then also the, the solution can be design, desi design based. There's a way to design these platforms so that they're not as vulnerable to attacks. And actually, there's one thing in Vermont here that I learned about that I'll talk about, uh, although maybe you, you all as, as uh, young students aren't involved in it, but I'm sure some of the faculty here are uh, Front Porch Forum. Um, this local social media platform where people connect to their, their local communities, talk about local events, what's going on with local businesses. There's actually been studies done on Front Porch Forum and how effective it is as kind of this um, uh, connector of people, uh, a way to de-escalate situations. There's no no big advertising on Front Porch Forum. It's not algorithmically generated. It's a chronological feed. People check in with their neighbors a little bit per day, and they find it really a positive place for interaction. And I'd love to see that model uh, replicated. Of course, it you know it doesn't feed that um, adrenaline rush that we get from other social media. But uh, perhaps as a public service, that's something for the government to invest in. And, and maybe somebody at Norwich could build it. <laughs> Colonel Boyd, you had sure. a comment? 
So uh, one of the other approaches that the special ops community takes to doing things outside of combat, you know, in the, this competitive environment, is teaching. And, and so become a leader in this space, right? Acquire all the knowledge you can. Just keep getting smarter, 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 and take it overseas. Um, I mean, it happens every day. It's happening now. That's what our forces are doing when they need to help our allies you know, improve because they're susceptible to this as, as we are. And if they happen not to have an advantage of being a have, a, have a symposium like this, which is likely they don't, they don't. And, and so you could bring it. Yeah, maybe I'll ask the crowd a question based upon that. Who here has had a class on disinformation, especially the dangers of social media and how to protect yourself? All right, so <laughs> put your hand down if you, well, I'm sorry, keep your hand up if you had it before college. All right, so you had it before college. The point is that it's not 100%. Yeah. So you guys are digital natives and yet have not been uh, informed in how to protect yourself on, on, a, on a platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll go to the left over. Good evening, y'all. Um, just Akibo. come a little closer to the mic, please. Good evening, y'all. I'm Shimdera Kibo. I'm just wondering if y'all have noticed there's like cycles with every new technology that comes out and how it's used in perception wars. So what you're saying a new technology comes out and then how does that affect like how, the cycle? Yep, of, how they're used. Like first it's fringe, then it becomes mainstream, then government finds out, and then rinse and repeat with each new technology. Do you guys mm -hmm. notice that rise and flow? Yeah, so, cool. I'll jump on that. So the improvised explosive device, electronic warfare was designed to help eliminate that as being a danger to soldiers. There was one person assigned, now there's a unit. So that's evolved. And of course, cyber, right? One person continues to evolve, now it's brigades. Um, so as technology is introduced, uh, the force is adapting. It recognizes that there's other tools to the trade. And, and we need to be superior in it. Um, we talked earlier today about whether or not, you know, in a Special Forces ODA, would we include, you know, what is space and cyber? Uh, there's leadership in Special Forces currently that think so um, in some respects. Uh, that will all evolve. And as I stated, it's actually wise at the, at the start to be able to leverage that kept capacity inside those organizations that are designed to develop that expertise. And, and bring it over, leverage it, apply it to a problem, and then put it back so it can continue to prosper, and then we, you know, go about our business. Yeah, and I would just add that, I mean, we have seen this through the nature of war throughout time, where something advances, there's a counter to that, and then you see something else that comes out that starts taking advantage in a different way. You see the same thing on the internet, uh, same thing with digital technologies. You good? good? All right. Next question. Good evening. I'm Andrew Higgins. I have a question about there's a lot of conflict going on in the Middle East, Arabia, but is there a region that you believe that's not getting enough tension in modern years, especially when it comes to technology, some places actively getting attacked, and nobody get, seems to give it enough attention? Uh, gosh, there's a lot. <laughs> Um, I, I know my colleagues at the Center for Information Resilience have done a lot of work in the Sahel and, uh, and Sudan recently that is not getting any play here. I would just say in general, the effects of the technology that we have today on countries in the global majority, what is sometimes referred to as the global south, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any attention. And just as one story of that, I, uh, in Ukraine in 2019, was there covering the election of, of President Zelensky. And uh, he, he won the vote. Uh, and in the days afterward, there was a proliferation of fake accounts of the president-elect. Um, and I had to write to a friend at Twitter to say, Perhaps you should give the real President Zelensky a blue check mark so that people know who they're replying to. And this is a country where there was an active war going on. 
is, is a, a European white country. And if you happen to be from a minority, non-English speaking, uh, brown country, you get a lot less attention. There was an entire genocide in Myanmar that Facebook recognized that it was in part responsible for uh, because they just don't, they ignore places that um, do not have the regulatory environment to push back and don't represent a lot of their market share. So uh, there's, there's also, there's conflicts, but there's the digital conflict side of things as well. And um, it's one thing that really, really uh, makes me irate about the social media platforms. I would pay attention to a few countries where the Russian government and the Chinese government are ac actively trying to to win over the population and exploit current policies, the war in Ukraine, to gain more support for their for their foreign policy. And they're based on um, increased viewership of Russian state-sponsored media, Chinese state-sponsored media. We could conclude potentially that they're being very effective. I'll pay attention to Brazil. I'll pay attention to South Africa, and I'll pay attention to Egypt. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Howard May. I had a question. <clears throat> I had a question about polarization. So in terms of in the past, you could have a political argument or debate with someone in a very polite, a professional manner. You could still be friends with them. They could even be one of your best best friends. Nowadays, it's like the hate is so extreme. It's like you can't even be friends with someone on the other side for a lot of people. It's like you're just wrong and there's no understanding or talking about it. So in terms of a little bit, a medium amount, or an extreme amount, I would ask how much of a role do you think information warfare has on this issue? Huge. I could start, but I probably, everyone probably has to, will agree with me that, the, um, in essence, information warfare and military doctrines of our adversaries are actively using our own vulnerabilities and our own divisions to polarize us further. So, information warfare and specifically disinformation narratives or propaganda are so effective in different countries because they're tailored to the particular topics that are sensitive to different countries. And I'd say that's a very powerful weapon. With regards to how to unite these debates and come closer, I come from Bulgaria. That's where I was raised. And I was born there and I was raised there. And when I came to the States, I, it's, it's very strange to me that foreign interference in our elections, because now I'm an American, is a partisan issue. It should not be a partisan issue. That is a threat to our democracy. And that is a common thing that we share, that we care about our democratic society. And we don't want a war on our own territory. And it is really bizarre to me that we will fight over something so important. So I think we have to communicate better to our own population in the US the dangers of foreign narratives, the dangers of interference from China and Russia in our domestic politics, and, and that it is not meant for our benefit, neither for the Republican benefit or dem a democratic benefit. If we, we have to create this rally around the flag or rally around the enemy effect, because in essence, those doctrines say divide and conquer. And unfortunately, we're falling exactly into that narrative. Thank you. Um, I, would, I would say medium, though, because I wouldn't want to take the emphasis away from, from the leaders that we elect into office in our country, but also in other countries, you know, for the, from the people who we place, uh, who we give this power to, to then go ahead and make those decisions that have to do with manipulating information. Thank you. Hey, good evening, I'm Cadet Besser. So my question deals with third party countries uh, that are not like specifically like the United States or Russia. So I think recently there's been like an increase of influence on like countries that are on the periphery of the United States, the sphere of influence. I think of like Hungary or the United Arab Emirates or even like the Shells and like these countries have ties and connections to political parties or political activists in Europe or America. And uh, it seems like it's like a roundabout or like a back channel for Russian misinformation to penetrate these countries. So uh, what is the United States' or their government's role in mitigating these like, conduits of misinformation? Like, how does it tackle this pretty like, specific and emerging issue? Mm. 
like that. Specific to Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> there are many countries which are more susceptible to, to narratives based on grievances, local grievances. I'd say, what is the role? Um, we talked about how to fight. The first question was great, how to fight disinformation. And I'd say, don't fight disinformation with disinformation. Fight it with the truth. Debunk the narratives as soon as possible and argue for the truth. That would be my response. I think this is another democratic resilience answer, unfortunately. So when we look at countries like Hungary, uh, or until very recently, Poland as well. Uh, Poland just had a, an election last fall that brought in a coalition government and, and some of the kind of autocratic backsliding that had been happening uh, has been reversed. But in Hungary, you know, one of the first things that the Orban government did when it came into power over a decade ago was to uh, decimate public media um, and change the protest laws in the country about what civil society was allowed to do. They also kind of dismantled or, or captured the courts. Uh, all of those three things are, are ways that Russian influence can seep in. We're seeing that happening in the Republic of Georgia right now as well. Um, so promoting democracy abroad, I think, is one of the most important ways that we can push back against influence from autocratic adversaries um, without, you know, doing uh, rote kind of counter disinformation work. In fact, I think it's one of the most effective ways to do it. Again, not the most satisfying, takes generations, but really, really important. You know, it is possible to prosecute people for spreading disinformation and to put them in jail. You know, other countries have done that. We haven't seen that in the US at all, but other countries have brought these cases to court and they have put these people in jail. So I think that connects to the democratic resilience part. Mm. So let me add Cadet Bissler. Uh, so we don't have State Department here, and they'd probably be really excited about answering that, this question. So I'll just let you know that that my boundaries. Uh, <laughs> but SOFT's in 80 some odd countries every day, and, and their task is not just to build alliances in that country, right? It's, it's to expand that country's alliances in and about its borders, right? Because they don't want right, that integrity of that nation to be affected by anybody's, you know, misunderstanding. And so they obviously try to establish those relationships and reinforce them. Earlier today, there was a discussion about language, what languages we learn, you know, should we know Chinese and Russian and so forth. Um, I don't see them being our in our alliance anytime soon. So it might be wise to ensure that if you're focusing language skills, that you focus on the, uh, the countries that you can have an alliance with. Got it. Thank you all. Sure. All right. So unfortunately, we're we're out of time for questions. Oh, um, <laughs> I hear all. <laughs> uh, so in this brief, you know, we, you know, discussion, we have explored perception wars and the battle to control your reality with our distinguished speakers. Realistically, we have just scratched the surface of of the work these amazing experts have been a part of throughout their distinguished careers. I encourage you to seek out their individual works, their talks, their books, and delve a little deeper because only through your education are you going to understand the challenge that we're actually facing. Um, you know, so th the challenge that we have with public trust and all the risk as we are here, collective perception of truth, news, reality, may be different not only due to different perspectives, but due to how our realities have been shaped by external actors. As we have seen, the impacts can be devastating through just some of the examples that we talked about, whether it's an attack on a, on a you know, pizza shop, there's an example there, a mob descending upon a peaceful town of Springfield, Ohio, insurrection against our government, or our inability to manage real world problems, or as the gentleman talked about, you know, we can't even have common discourse between us. Our perceptions are under attack each day. We must always question what we hear, ask who may be manipulating us, and who stands to benefit. And with that, I want you to thank our distinguished guests, and we appreciate everybody spending so much great time with us. We are much richer for your, your, your time here with us. I appreciate it.